Valerie. <laughs> wow, thank you, my and Valerie, for that up-tempo beat of open my eyes that I may see. And now we are going to open our ears so that we may hear our speaker this morning, our dynamic minister, our own Reverend John Scott. Please help me welcome him to the podium. Yes, open your ears and listen up. Good morning, family. Good morning, friends. Remember our greeting last week, infinite love and expressions of joy? It's greetings and salutations, and the response is? Infinite love and expressions of joy. Let us send out that infinite love and those expressions of joy to everyone who joins us on the internet and to all our, our human family all across the globe who have been faced with some really major challenges, haven't, haven't we, with these past hurricanes these last few weeks. I think the thousands of people in the USA and here in the Caribbean affected by the two hurricanes must be feeling as though their pain is simply too much to bear. And the time for light thinking really is now. This is a time when we have to lift our consciousness and keep the high watch and know the truth for our human family, that God is at the center and the circumference of all human experiences. And so sometimes, you know, my friends, the storm we experience is an emotional one rather than a weather system, don't? Sometimes we really are just so, and it can be just as devastating. It can, it, can, it can tear you up just as much and leave you feeling just as bereft as um, a physical, a tornado, a hurricane, a tsunami, whatever. When a loved one dies, for example, we may easily believe that we will never again allow ourselves to love. It happens to me even when I lost, I lost the last dog I had. I thought, never another dog. I can't manage this parting, you know, it's, the pain is just so intense and so palpable. Of course, you, you learn to go beyond that and to know the truth. Um, so, we all live in, in a kind of fear of what might be sometimes. And of course, the news media hypes it to the nth degree, don't they? And the social media and all the other wonderful ways we have of communicating with each other. We almost seem to take a delight in terrifying each other of, you know, the, the next, the latest horror, you know, and we sit there spellbound watching it um, hour after hour after hour. And then, you know, you have the socio-political storms as well, unleashed upon us by warring factions, which have been known to keep us battened down in our homes, afraid to venture out. That's also another kind of storm, isn't it? Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of our great uh, teaching, writes in the Science of Mind textbook, page 145, and I quote, until we awake to the fact that we are one in nature with God, we shall not find the way of life. Until we awaken to the fact that we are one in nature with God. And I want to talk about this oneness um, a little bit um, this morning. And I have titled my encouragement, You Are the One, the Only Begotten. Can we say, I am the one, the only begotten? Can we say that? I am the one, the only begotten. So until we awake to the fact that we are really one, that we're all connected, we can't find the way of life that we all want, or the world that we want, and that we are seeking to make work for everyone. Glenn Clark, a contemporary of Ernest Holmes, wrote, and I quote, we need to pray for a new sanity to come into the hearts of mankind the world over so that human beings may soon see that God is calling them to understand each other, to forgive each other, and to cooperate with each other, unquote. Sometimes, unfortunately, it takes an earthquake or a hurricane or forest fires or a tsunami to make us stop and listen to that inner urging for us to hold each other's hands. You have noticed that when there is a disaster in human terms, human beings rise to their highest in terms of helping. The first responders put their own lives to one side and just think of how they can help. And at those times, all the social barriers are, are at least for a while, removed, and we see only 
our brothers and sisters, our family, our human family in need of help. You know, I never forget our last big one, Gilbert. It was, what, 1988, here in Jamaica. And an old friend of mine, she was elderly lady, she lived alone in the hills um, outside of Kingston. And after the hurricane had passed, um, next morning there was a huge, I can't remember whether it was a mango or a guinea tree, but a big tree had fallen across her front door. And she was standing there thinking, no, how am I going to handle this? Her back door had been um, swollen shut, so she was in feeling trapped inside. And just as she was wandering this, up her garden path wanders a young man. Now, when you live up in those, in those country, um, places, you know everybody, eh? she didn't recognize him, but he was a young man carrying a machete. And he said, Mommy, you want some help to move that, 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 this tree here? Yeah? And she said, thank you, my son. And she says he worked from sunup until sundown. He made match wood of that mango tree and stacked the branches in a safely, safe distance from the house. She offered him food and he, decli and he declined, he thanking her only for um, a bottle of water and worked the entire day. So at the end of the day, she said, oh, just wait a minute, I'm going to go see how much money I have in my purse to pay you for the day's work. And he said, no money, mama, just give me a blessing. And he left, she gave him the blessing, and you can imagine that prayer from her heart, eh? And he left and she never saw him again. And when she asked around the, the community, nobody knew who he was or had seen him either when she described him. Um, where did he come from, you know? But there he was um, in her moment of need. I think it was Shakespeare in, in the play Troilus and Cressida who writes, one touch of nature makes the whole world kin. One touch of nature, it only needs one breeze blow and we begin to say, Lord, how can I help? It makes us remember our humanity and our kinship. That kingdom of heaven which is at hand and in which we are called to live as brothers and sisters and as children of the Most High. So I believe, my friends, that one of our, our jobs as students of the science of mind and as awakening individuals at this time in, in the history of humankind. It's not only just to pray, I know people think that we in, we in, in New Thought just look at our neighbors and contemplate them, and truly because we say the work is within and upon the self, but there is also the need for us to reach out and touch and to help and to recognize the divinity in our fellow human beings, no matter where they are. Kyle Campbell told a wonderful story one evening at Tuesday evening service about an old lady in halfway tree, which has just been in my heart because she was just moved to say, are you all right, mother? She was sitting on the, on the sidewalk, eh? She was lying on the sidewalk and Carol went out and reached out to her and gave her some money and you know, interacted with her. And at the end, she said, help me up and give me a hug. And I just thought, you know, how many of us would, would reach out and hug somebody who was in that state, as you may imagine, on the streets of Kingston? So that, thank you for that, Carol. It just really just asked, 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 gave you a whole page in my journal. So, you know, you know that's how, how much of an impression it made on me. So th those of us, my friends, who are conscious of our oneness and how we have a, an enormous responsibility, we must let go of the yesterdays and allow the unifying light of love to penetrate the darkness of ignorance uh, that would keep our human family in needless, pointless, futile enmity. There really has to be a way to do this. And so you know, I want to tell you that every time I see missiles being launched and landing in the sea near Guam, or, or I see police altercations with citizens here in Jamaica or elsewhere in the world, I pause I take a deep centering breath and I say, ho, opo, nopo, no. You remember that Hawaiian prayer of oneness? It means, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, I love you. Just one word, ho, opo, nopo, no. Let me hear you if you can wrap your mouth around it. Ho, opo, nopo, no. Fast, ho, opo, nopo, no. Let me hear. Not ho po 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 no. Ho open open no. And if you can't remember that, just say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Um, 
thank you, I love you. Because you know, friends, if we really are connected, then it means that some part of us has something to do with all of the happenings around the world. I wonder every time we, we criticize somebody, aren't we launching a missile of judgment against them? Every time we, we think other, you know, that person is other, different to me, what we are doing is we are at war. Instead of saying, this is my brother, this is my sister, this is my family. And so here is your assignment. Your assignment is whenever you see that those images on TV or social media of man's inhumanity to man or the, the, the power and majesty of natural phenomenon, just stop and say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. Ho, open, open, open. Can you do that as an assignment this week? to just use it to bless the world. And um, I really commend it to you as a practice. This is why it is a matter of earnest priority that we ourselves, uh, we see ourselves and all humanity in the new light. The light of light thinkers. The light that recognizes that God is who we are and that we are the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. And there's an interesting explanation of this only begotten son that was used to describe Jesus, which I want to share with you. Um, Roko Eriko, who is the Aramaic scholar, you know, Aramaic was the language Jesus spoke, and he's, he's, uh, he studied this language. And he gives a very interesting explanation of that only begotten um, phrase used in the King James Version of the Bible. He says that there is little Greek justification for translating the word monogenes as only begotten. So the word used was monogenes, and it, it occurs as early as in Genesis 22, verse 2. Let me read it to you. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. So that take your only son. And Rocco says that that only, um, really should be translated as unigenitus, which is near to the Hebrew word, um, which means not only as in exclusive or only as in that one alone, but as precious. So take your precious son. And so how, how it came to be that, we, uh, that it came down through the ages that we think of the only begotten as being the one and only. Um, it really should be, instead of the only begotten, begotten only of the Father. And it happened because um, St. Jerome, circa 342 to 420 AD, I think, um, who was noted for his translation of the Bible into Latin, it was called the Latin Vulgate, he used the translation of um, the word monogenes to mean unigenitus, only begotten, because he was trying to prove the, the Aryan philosophy that Jesus was begotten, not made, begotten, not created. So you see the, the, the translation is used to, to give a, a slant to the belief system that was prevalent. But John uses the term, the Hebrew term, which is near to it, Yehidiah, and to designate the unique relationship of an only begotten, a begotten only son, a precious son. And if you read the Bible in the context of, of the culture it was written for and the time, then you know that in the Near East, the firstborn was considered the heir, the sole heir, and had responsibility for looking after his father's um, estate and, and his, the father's wife or wives, and, and so, only was used in that sense, the sense of being the number one in charge. But it didn't mean that that was the only son. And um, Jesus proved that in his teaching and in his ministry, that we are divinely the children, daughters, and sons of the one present and the one power that created us only out of itself. So you are the only begotten, or if you prefer, 
you are begotten only of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let us affirm, I am God's beloved, begotten only of the Father. I am God's beloved, begotten only of the Father. Say to your neighbor, you are God's beloved, begotten only of the Father. You are God's beloved, begotten only of the Father. Namaste. You are God's beloved, begotten only of the Father. You remember Alexander Juma, who wrote um, The Three Musketeers? He gave the three pals a slogan, do you remember it? All for one and one for all, which was their rallying cry of unity, of beautifully expressing the ideal of oneness. For my friends, when we begin to realize our oneness with each other, then cultural, racial, and other perceived differences begin to fade. And we no longer entertain feelings of being better than or less than other people. Instead, we begin to live from a consciousness, the light thinking of our connection with all humankind and indeed our connection with all life kind. I think that one of the most amazing things you know is, is about creation is that no two people, no two creations are exactly alike. I mean, even identical twins are not really identical. There are differences. And I'm always amused when young people, and some older people too, want to be exactly like their whatever the idol is that they're currently idolizing. You know, and the thing is, you really can't be somebody else. That's, that's imitation. You know, you are unique. Um, and that oneness is really at the center of our relationships with everybody we encounter. Um, I told you that I'm, I've begun writing a book about our, our um, intervention, Reverend Michael and myself, Reverend Anna and, and Carol Charlton in the, um, the prisons here in Jamaica. And in my book, I tell the story, it's a beautiful story, of a, of a young man, um, one of the participants. And the story com comes out of an exercise that we give them. When we were designing the, the curriculum, I thought to myself, they have so many negatives stacked against them, you know, and they're in a place that doesn't generate or foster good feelings about themselves. So we, we put in this exercise where we ask them to think about a time in their lives when they felt good about themselves. That's the first part of the exercise. Think about a time in your life when you fe felt good about yourself. Do it for me too. Think about a time in your life when you felt good about yourself. Can you do that? Everybody, go, and everybody is there? And then think about what quality you were expressing at that time. Hmm. Can you do that? Anybody want to tell me, want to just share what made you feel good about yourself and what the quality was? The quality was joy, and, and, and what made you feel that joy? A feeling of accomplishment. Good, anybody else want to share a time when you felt good about yourself? In your independence, and what was the quality you were just, you were expressing? Independence too. Satisfaction. Satisfaction. Wonderful. Well, this young man um, tells a story uh, about a time when he felt good about himself. His baby mother, to be, was expecting their first child, and <laughs> first of all, he wanted a, a, a boy, a youth, a young lion. But the ultra something, which we know is the ultrasound, I quote him, the ultra something, say is a daughter. And he said to himself, well, whatever, is Jai, if, whatever the will of Jai is, him accept that. Just want the baby to be a healthy, vibrant, wonderful baby. And then as it was drawing night to the time when she was to, to give birth, they lived in this tiny room in the inner city and there was a storm raging outside. And it wasn't a weather system. It was a gang war to end all gang wars. And fearing that a bullet may whiz through their, 
if, you know, if their window or the, 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 wooden, the wooden walls of the, of the room, he put his baby mother under the bed as far as she would go. Just picture that picture. And then he crouched over her bulging stomach and her legs to make himself a human shield. And he said all the time he was, he was talking soothingly, trying to keep her and himself um, calm. And my friends, at a time when the sons of God were outside, bent on destroying lives that they did not create, our hero's baby decided this was time to make its entrance. And so in the middle of gunshot of pop, uh, the noise and the, the confusion of the outer storm, she said to him, babes, my water just break. So the class said, sitting in, class sitting in, you know, rapt attention and, you know, said, what you do? He said, I don't know what, we don't even know what we do, but in the movies, them say you must boil water. I boil water. I tell you, I boil, I boil a big pot of water and I find every condensed can and I boil water. He knew not what to do. This, this, long story short, he delivered his baby. And he said, when we look, Lord God, the, the master gave me a young lion. It was a boy. Amazing, eh? So the, sometimes the ultra something, no? If, no? When, you t when they pick it, turn backwards, and you just <laughs> yes, one thing I think is another. You know, friends, I said, how did you feel? Him say, how me feel? Me don't know how me feel. But I know how God must feel when he created us. Wow. I know how God must feel, the creator must feel when he looked at this amazing creation of his and said, this is good. My words, no, not his. He just said, I know how God must feel when he created us. But can you imagine the creator looking at us with eyes of love and just saying, this is good and very good. So you know, as a, the facilitator, I said, so what was the quality? And let me give you in his own words. Quote, if every man could see his first child being born, there would be no more abuse of women. Wow, this is from a 22 or 23 year old, incarcerated, whom society might say, done with that. No, I have nowhere to go. See if anything don't dead in Jamaica, don't call it duppy. Or don't dash it away. Right. Friends, sometimes it takes people a lifetime to come to the realization that we are all part of the one and that each one of us is indeed unique and has a special contribution to make, a special gift to give. And one of the things we're trying to do with those young men, and not so young men, some of them, is to help them to come up with a purpose for their lives. You know, and sometimes the purpose is to be right where they are in that institution, learning a skill or teaching something or discovering themselves. As, as some have said, if I wasn't in here, I give thanks for being in here, because otherwise I would be on a slab in a morgue somewhere. So the divine plan is so, is, is so intricate and so amazing and so wonderful that we must just learn to see God right where we are and to know that each one in our experience is begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Hebrews call the, first, the, the firstborn son the Yehi, the, the Yehi Daya, the Yehi Daya, or Daya, um, Sabbath Daya, Yehi Daya. And it meant the precious son. And of course, that the Middle East, there were only sons, eh? But now we know it's sons and daughters, <laughs> that everybody is a precious offspring of the living Spirit Almighty. And so that is the truth I want you to know for yourself, that you are begotten of the Father, that you are the only begotten, full of grace and truth. So I want to just thank you for sharing your uniqueness, your God-likeness, and your radiant consciousness with us today. 
Ho Oponopono. To God be the glory. Namaste.